Uh, the U.S. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good morning, Paul. We're doing well. Late night, got in late, but I'm in Brookhaven now on an early morning, but that's okay. That's what I'm here for. No damage there from the storms, was it? No, we did not have significant damage. We got very, very lucky. I was in D.C. tracking that very yeah. closely, especially when the alarm came out that there was one over Brookhaven. But uh, we were very fortunate. I think Wayne County was not as fortunate, but no death, no fatalities. You know, we we really dodged a bullet there. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw some pictures coming out of Wayne's County, and, and the, I think there were a couple of places hit and uh, rather demolished. Oh, yes, and some poultry houses mm-hmm. are gone. And uh, I haven't really had a chance to to survey the storm damage yet because I just landed last night and got into Brookhaven about 11. But, uh, yeah, we it, it, we do have damage. But, you know, uh, no loss of life. Um, I, I, I think there ought to be a study. Maybe you could get some federal funds since you're up there. Uh, the connection between tornadoes and, and chickens and poultry houses. <laughs> It's kind of like the same connection of mobile homes. I'm That's sure. exactly right. And if you, <laughs> they you only have... hit mobile home parks. I'm sure it has nothing to be, do with the stability of the structure. It's the same with the stability of the so structure. That, well, the, there, there's got to be a connectivity because where you have a poultry home, a poultry house, and a mobile home somewhere, your your odds are going up pretty dramatically. So. In all seriousness, uh, we were talking about this earlier this morning when you just heard a cut where the president said that he thought uh, Putin was a killer. I'm not sure how that's going to further the alliance between our two countries and, and all the, the the talk about Putin and, uh, and Donald Trump of all those four years. It, it is r- remarkable what's going on now. And, as you also heard, Putin has officially challenged him to a live debate which would be rather scary, but let's talk about the atmosphere in Washington D.C. right now. It's got to be um, it's got to be as tense as ever. Certainly, when you're in an environment where it's fifty-fifty, and there is talk about filibuster, and you know they want to do it, do away with it. Oh, no doubt they want to do away with it, and we're just clinging to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, and uh, hoping that they stand firm. They. Joe Manchin again reiterated his commitment to that, mm-hmm. and uh, so did Cinema. So that is the only saving grace that we have. Overall, you know, it it did get very contentious when we were talking about the last relief bill, the American, you know, disaster relief. Yeah. And uh, you know, it it was just zero there. It was absolutely zero input from Republicans on that bill. And, uh, you know, I met with Louisa Terrell. She is the White House Director of Legislative Affairs Mm -hmm. for Joe Biden. And I don't know him. And when she was sitting in my office, I told her, I said, you know, I don't know President Biden. I just, you know, didn't start up with him. I don't know him. And she continued to say, well, my boss wants to unify people. My boss wants to work across the aisle. And my boss is one that, when he was a senator, would not pass a bill without Republican input. And about the fourth time she said my boss, I stopped her in her tracks. I said, you know, I don't know your boss. I didn't have the opportunity to start with him. But I can tell you, on this last Recovery Act, the American Recovery Act that we passed that spent almost $2 trillion that we will never be able to pay even the interest on this, Mm -hmm. I had no input in on it, and no Republican had input on it. So the things that you said, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I can tell you I haven't seen it at all. We sent 10 Republicans down to the White House to visit with him on that. You talk about lip service in its finest form. He was. They were very nice, very cordial, and the ten came back to the Senate saying, "Oh, that went so well." Zero happened from that meeting. I mean, we're talking about nothing happened there. And I let her know I will work with anybody on anything. It does not matter. And uh, you know, and I'm still willing to work with the White House and the majority on. You know, the issues that are important to Mississippi, my gosh, we've got rural hospitals, you name it, workforce development. 
you know, we've got so many issues. But uh, I let her know pretty quickly that so far it has not been bipartisan. And uh, Betty Thompson and I have been on the phone together this week working on the issue with the city of Jackson. And he and I can work together because I'm going to always make sure, you know, we don't agree on everything, obviously, but I'm going to be the one to step out, walk across that aisle or try to cross that aisle to find common ground because we are in the minority. We never steamrolled them just because we could. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I told Ms. Terrell. I said, you know, you have steamrolled us on this because you can So uh, unless things change, which I sure hope that they will, you know, we're we're not there yet. And uh, we're talking about some dangerous policies, Paul, that we're going to be looking at. Well, here's the reality, and I I think we both know this, because you've been in politics a long time. It ain't going to change. The only thing that's going to change maybe in two years as far as the midterm elections. It's the only thing, because number one... From day one, well, before day one, during the during the election it, uh, itself, and certainly during the time he held the title president elect till the inauguration, he talked about bringing people together, and he's done just the opposite. It's not going to change. It's going to stay the way it is. Republicans in Washington D.C. have got to get smart, have got to band together, and have got to look at the t- the, the the midterm to save this country. And whatever it takes, I don't see that happening in Washington cohesively. Hopefully, it's happening behind the scenes. I, I hear the things McConnell is saying about how dastardly and how dangerous it is what's going on in Washington, but we hope that there's some kind of plan that the Republicans are putting together for for the midterm. Well, that's exactly it. Um, Georgia, everything is riding on Georgia. And Georgia tends to be, it looks to me like, 52, 48 states. Mm-hmm. We can win Georgia. And uh, we had better be getting our strategy together right now. And I worked very hard with all the farmers and ranchers in Georgia in this last election. So, you know, I've kind of got this, we did a Zoom call every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time Mm -hmm. with the farmers and ranchers, and I would have seven and eight U.S. senators on each Zoom call. I would have, I would go, you know, to them and say, you've got to help me in Georgia. And we did band together on that. We came up short, but there's several reasons for that. And uh, I I truly think we can take Georgia back if we continue to band together and have the right candidate that can come out of the primary. Is is Herschel Walker going to run? Is is, uh, that a possibility? That's the unknown. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't know that. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know him. But I know the president likes him a whole lot, or mm-hmm. the former president likes him a whole lot, uh, former President Trump. But, uh, you know, we're just going to have to work this smart. I mean, oh, it's I, just I don't a lot disagree. of done the night before in the rally that, uh, you know, we, we just got to do it smart, do it wisely, and we've got to raise money to do it because it will be ungodly amounts of money. But we're ready to do that, you know, because... Yeah. You know, I know what it's like to be in the minority right now, and it is no fun when we passed five COVID relief bills, truly bipartisan. All right, could you hold on for a second? got a break coming up here. Just hold on for just a minute. We'll get back. Cindy Hyde-Smith. Let's talk about the Emergency Water Infrastructure Improvement Act and exactly what is going on because it affects Jackson, and what affects Jackson affects uh, a, a lot of the state, and as a matter of fact, there are a lot of people in the state beside Jackson that have some water problems. So speak to that, if you will. Oh, yeah, I'll be glad to. Obviously, we all know what happened after the ice storm and uh, the resulting of that. But one of the key things, Paul, is I was on a Zoom call with the Mississippi School of the Deaf. We are communicating through sign language and an interpreter, and it was on a completely different subject matter than the water issue, but all of them, you know, relate. They they just talked about them having no water for days. The Mississippi School of the Deaf, the Mississippi School of the Blind, for days did not have water. And buddy, you talk about something that will motivate you to make some things happen. Those schools have been in Jackson for years and years and years, and along with these small businesses and things. 
that are suffering from this. But I did introduce the, uh, we call it the Emergency Water Infrastructure Improvement Act. It's uh, Senate Bill 755. I thought Lucky 7, and they're located on I-55. Maybe we can get some things done. Mm-hmm. But it takes a multi-pronged, as we're calling it, approach to um, to help this situation. And, it, you know, I'm not trying to tell the city of Jackson exactly what they need to be doing but I am offering some solutions, but more so I'm offering financial solutions that is the only thing that's going to fix it. But I'm certainly uh, open to suggestions. Yeah. And what it will do, um, we included three agency. It increases the authorized level of support the city's eligible to receive through the Corps of Engineers. The Section 219 we refer to all the time, Environmental Infrastructure Program, and it increases that level. It gives them the authority from $25 million to $47 million. And then the next one is $150 million to the EPA. I'm directing funds to EPA Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Program so they can make grants to the state um, that, you know, that we've suffered all these disasters. So, you know, we can make grants to the state to go in that direction. And uh, we can issue loans to municipalities that are impacted by the, the storms. And so it's not it's more than just the city of Jackson, but uh, the set aside not less than twenty five million mm-hmm. in the economic development administration grants from municipal municipalities like Jackson. And uh, you know this is coming up with real money to get this. Things started. This this has got to pass. Days. This has got to pass in the Senate and in the House yet. I mean, you Correct. just introduced this. Um, right. Is this with matching money? Because it's there. There happened to be a municipality that has very little money to match anything with. This does not. The federal side of this, of uh, the particular things that we've identified, mm-hmm. it uh, it just ensures that a percentage of the funds will be used. Um, I mean, and we got distinct things in there to uh, install the new meters, to modernize the billing system, which has been a huge problem yes, it is. with the billing system. And, you know, this has just been delayed maintenance for years and years and years. But, uh, you know, we're not worried about, you know, how we got here. All I know that we're here and the people in our capital city and those schools and those businesses, they're in dire straits. And I reached out to um, Benny Thompson this week. I shot him a text. He called me uh, that night. And because we're going to have to obviously have Democrat support to get this passed. And a standalone bill I'm not, you know, comfortable with because it, it's just the chances are so reduced. So Congressman Thompson is helping me. Find something that, you know, is coming through the House that we can work together to make this happen. Because, I mean, it is a critical need. Of course, you know, my heart is down at those fairgrounds, too, and all the events that comes in through there. But the cities that had to close, I mean, the businesses that had to close for so many days and weeks that they could not even operate. The restaurants, you know, when we're calling to... Check on the restaurants. Oh, we're not open at all. We don't have water. You can't let these businesses suffer. Somebody's got to step up. They've got to make sure that we have real solutions that can address this. Listen, and, uh, in the, the intent. In the, in, the, in the stimulus bill itself, there was some dollars available there as far as infrastructure? Yes, there were some dollars available there that we're looking at, but... It would not fix this problem. I got you. We're, we're wrestling a bear. Right? Jenny, did, did, a did, Benny, did Benny ever tell you how much money is? Let's talk specifically about the capital city because I've heard every any anything from forty seven million, forty nine million to up to a hundred or two hundred million dollars. But I'm not sure ex- how extensive they were talking about. Oh no, it's going to be more than a hundred million dollars. Mm. It's going to be more than that. And long term, um, getting it fixed. So. Right. That's it. But there's safety guards in there. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, you know, provisions on who's going to handle this money. And, uh, you know, the involvement that uh, the governor's going to have some involvement in this and deciding exactly what happens and who signs off on it. Because 
I am very a conservative, and I have to know that this is money well spent and that we have the uh, proper things in place that it will be oversight to that and that we will actually fix the problem. And down the road, you know, we, uh, we're just going to have to continue to stay on top of it. The bill hasn't passed. You know, we have people calling the office. I just introduced it, you know, this week. We just introduced it. Yeah. So we've got, you know, we've got a lot of work in front of us to uh, get What's there, the procedure? What that Before it actually goes to a floor vote, it's got to go through a lot of other things. So just realistically... How long do you think it'll be before it uh, it hits that uh, that level as far as on the floor debate? Well, according to uh, Ms. Terrell, that was in my house in my office from the White House, mm-hmm. she she re- reflected that we could possibly have an infrastructure bill in eight to ten months. So uh, you know, if we could get it in there, not saying that that is what we're going to attach it to, but that's a possibility. I got you. I got you. So it's not going to be overnight, but uh, you know, if we can get to that point, get it in an overall mm-hmm. bill, with the chances and likelihood of it passing, would be better. Let me let but me ask I, you. I, I'm I just, about to run out of time, and I don't want to uh, to lose this without uh, asking you the question. But part of the filibuster worry that we have doing away with that is they are biting at the bit to pass something. It doesn't really matter if it's effective or not as far as gun control. There are several different things moving their way through, certainly easily in the House. And one of them that scares the bejeebers out of everybody is this dropping of of, uh, immunity to gun manufacturers and also ammo manufacturers. Oh, it is unbelievable what they could do if that happens. I mean, we're getting dust rolled on so many things now. When you lose that filibuster that it takes 60% 60 votes to end the debate, I mean, you're looking at tax hikes, you're looking at unbelievable climate change rules, immigration, and then, of course, the gun control. That's going to be a priority. They're going to certainly put that in there. And just in the past two weeks, the House has passed three gun control bills. They passed three. Yeah. And Biden has already already said that he wants a tax increase to be the first one in in uh, fifteen or twenty years the, as high as it is. Plus the fact we just got a tax increase uh, in the last couple of three weeks on every American citizen that's killing the the middle class. Because when you fill up your car for a dollar fifty um, several weeks ago and now it's three dollars, that's double, in and it's costing the American taxpayers a tremendous amount. For yeah. the administration that was so good to the middle class, he's killing us. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, Mike McIntyre at Kapai Lincoln Junior College taught me economics. Mm-hmm. And I just think the basic fundamentals of economics, did you guys never take a basic economics class? Because none of this is adding up. It is just spend, spend, spend. Yep. And, uh, you know, with just not looking down the road at the future of the next generations at all. I, I do. Davis yep. so eloquently put it. He said, Senator, he said, this country is going to hell in a handbasket and we got a front row seat. True. Unfortunately, I, I just hope that everybody gets it together as far as GOP and, and has some type of uh, game plan for two years from now. Because if not, then we'll not make it four years. And that's. It, it, we, oh. We've reached the, a point where they make no bones about it. it. It was, we went from make America stronger again to make the Democratic Party stronger again, and, and, okay. and uh, there's no ruse about it. Senator, it's always they good talking to you, election sir. election laws, yep. you know, that's yep. it. That is guaranteed Democratic control. If they make Puerto Rico well. and D.C. state, that's guaranteed. Throw in, throw in about 15 people on the Supreme Court and uh, say goodbye to everything that the Founding Fathers.